It's our pleasure to welcome you uh, to our 35th anniversary season of Shakespeare in the Park. Uh, this has been a wonderful season, a very long season, and uh, we're delighted to welcome you to the last two weeks of production and uh, to a series that we have looked forward to for a long time, the entire Henry VI trilogy. Tonight we will be performing part one, tomorrow part two, and Sunday part three. So we expect you to come back tomorrow and Sunday. <laughs> we uh, have plenty of room up here if you'd like to pitch a tent. We have running water, and as Tom Bodette says, we'll leave the light on for you. Um, it reminds me of a story that Woody Allen once told about uh, taking a speed reading class. He says, I learned to read War and Peace in 30 minutes. It's about Russia. <laughs> this is going to take a little bit longer than that. But it will be a, a delightful uh, evening for you, I am quite sure. Um, a few special thank yous, a few announcements. Uh, first, a thank you to uh, David Nykopf, who brought this wonderful work to us and has put um, a lot of time and effort into carefully selecting the cast, directing the play, uh, working with us uh, so much on um, all of these little things that uh, go into making the production wonderful. Um, tonight, and you may have seen this in your playbill, uh, you'll need to be able to uh, tell the players. Uh, yellow sashes tonight mean the English. Blue sashes mean the French. I'll explain tomorrow night about the other colors. Uh, we have a convention for a lighting convention uh, for Mr. Logan, who is playing our Gloucester. Uh, Mr. Logan, uh, Humphrey Duke of Gloucester. When his light is on, he's with us. <laughs> when his light is out, he is a figment of your imagination. <laughs> he has gone away. You can ignore him. Uh, there will be one 15-minute intermission this evening, at uh, which point uh, our actors will be circulating through the audience with hat in hand. Our productions are always free to the public, uh, but we hope that if you enjoy the performance, you'll give generously. Also, the restrooms are located in the upper... Um, octagonal building at the upper uh, part of the amphitheater, just as you came in. The ladies' room is on the left. The gentlemen's room is on the right. Uh, during the intermission, our concession stand will be open. The upper center of the amphitheater, we have uh, uh, cold drinks, we have hot drinks. It depends on the weather. Uh, wonderful sandwiches and uh, lots of snacks. I've been told they're all calorie-free and fat-free and everything like that. So just enjoy it. Um, oh, yes, if you have a cell phone, this is our pager. It's a good time to put it on silent or vibrate so it won't disturb your neighbors or the cast. Hazel Robinson Amphitheater is also a non-smoking facility. Smoking area is located at the entrance to the amphitheater. Uh, tonight we are being filmed uh, for uh, URTV, your and our public access television station. Wonderful, wonderful pleasure. Um, and also, um, we hope that if you brought a uh, camera that you'll feel free to use it. But uh, for the safety of the cast, um, please don't use flash photography because uh, it could, um, with all of these sharp pointy things that so many of us are carrying around, we could stick to where we don't intend to. Without further ado, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy part one of King Henry VI. Hung be the heavens with black, yield day to night. Comets, importing change of times and states, 
Brandish your crystal tresses in the sky, and with them scourge the bad revolting stars that have consented unto Henry's death. King Henry V, too famous to live long, England ne'er lost a king of so much worth. England ne'er had a king until his time. Virtue he had, deserving to command. What should I say? His deeds exceed all speech. He near left up his hand, but did conquer. We mourn in black. Why mourn we not in blood? Henry is dead, and never more shall re revive. Upon a wooden coffin we attend, and death's dishonest victory we with our stately presence glorify. He was a king, blessed of the king of kings, under the French, a dreadful judgment day. So dreadful will not be as was his sight. The battles of the Lord of hosts he fought. The church's prayers made him so prosperous. The church, where is it? Had not churchmen prayed, his thread of life had not so soon decayed. None do you like but an effeminate prince whom like a schoolboy you may overawe. Gloucester, whate'er we like, thou art protector and looks to command the prince and realm. My wife is proud, she holdeth thee in awe more than God or religious churchman may. Name not religion, for thou lovest the flesh, and ne'er throughout the year to church thou goest, except it be to pray against thy foes. Cease, cease these jaws, and rest. Your mind's in peace. Let's to the altar. Herald, wait on us. Instead of gold, we'll offer up our arms, since arms avail not now that Henry's dead. Posterity, await for wretched years, when at their mother's moist eyes babes shall, shall suck, our isle be made a nourish of salt tears, and none but women left to wail the dead. Henry V, thy ghost I invocate. Prosper this realm, keep it from civil broils, combat with adverse planets in the heavens. My honorable lords, health to you all. Sad tidings bring I to you out of France, of loss, of slaughter, and discomfiture. Guyenne, Champagne, Rheims, Orléans, Paris, Gisors, Poitiers, all are quite lost. What sayest thou, man, before did Henry's course? Speak softly, for the loss of those great towns will make him burst his lead and rise from death. Is Paris lost? Is Rouen lost, yielded up? If Henry were recalled to life again, these news would cause him once more to yield the ghost. How are they lost? What treachery was used? No treachery, but want of men and money. Amongst the soldiers, this is muttering, that here you maintain several factions, and whilst the field should be dispatched and fought, you are disputing of your generals. One would have lingering wars with little cost. Another would fly swift, but wanteth wings. A third thinks, without expense at all, by guileful fair words, peace may be obtained. Awake, awake, English nobility. Let not sloth dim your honors, new begot. Crossed are the flower de luces in your arms. Of England's coat, one half is cut away. For our tears wanting to this funeral, these tidings would call forth their flowing tides. Me, they concern. Regent, I am of France. Give me my steeled coat. I'll fight for France. Away with these disgraceful wailing robes. Wounds will I lend the French instead of eyes to weep their intermissive miseries. Lords, you these letters full of bad mischance. France is revolted from English quite, except some petty towns of no import. The Dauphin Charles is crowned queen, king, in Rem. The bastard of Orleans with him is Joy. Rainer, Duke of Anjou, doth take his part. Duke of Alençon fleeth to his side. The Dauphin 
crowned king? All fly to him? Oh, whither shall we fly from this reproach? We will not fly, but to our enemy's throats. Bedford, if thou be slack, I'll fight it out. Gloucester, why doubtest thou my forwardness? An army have I mustered in my thoughts, wherewith already France is o'errun. My gracious lords, to add to your laments, wherewith you now bedew King Henry's hairs, I must inform you of a dismal fight betwixt the stout Lord Talbot and the French. Wherein Lord Talbot overcame, is it so? Oh no, wherein Lord Talbot was overthrown. The circumstance, I'll tell you more at large. The 10th of August, last this dreadful Lord, retiring from the siege of Orleans, having full scare 6,000 in his troop, by three and 23,000 of the French was round encompassed and set upon. More than three hours the fight continued, where valiant Talbot, above human thought, enacted wonders with his sword and lance. Hundreds he sent to hell, and none durst stand him. Here, there, and everywhere, enraged he flew. The French exclaimed, the devil was in arms. All the whole army stood agazed on him, his soldiers spying his undoubted spirit. A Talbot, a Talbot, cried out amain, and rushed into the bowels of the battle. Enclosed were they with their enemies, a base Walloon to win the Dauphin's grace. Thrust Talbot with a spear into the back, whom all France with their chief assembled strength durst not presume to look once in the face. Is Talbot slain? Then I will slay myself for living idly here in Pompanese, while such a worthy leader, wanting aid, not to his dastard foeman is betrayed. Oh no, he lives, but is took prisoner, and Lord Scales with him, and Lord Hungerford. Most of the rest slaughtered, or took likewise. His ransom, there is none but I shall pay. I'll hail the dolphin headlong from his throne. His crown shall be the ransom of my friend. Farewell, my masters, to my task will I. 10,000 soldiers with me I will take, whose bloody deeds shall make all Europe quake. So you had need, for Orleans is besieged. The English army is grown weak and faint. The Earl of Salisbury craves supply, and hardly keeps his men from mutiny, since they, so few, watch such a multitude. Remember, lords, your oaths to Henry sworn either to quell the Dauphin utterly, or bring him into obedience to your yoke. I do remember it. And here, take my leave to go about my preparation. I'll to the tower with all the haste I can to view the artillery and munition, and then I will proclaim young Henry king. Each! Have his place and function to attend. I am left out, for me nothing remains. But long I will not be Jack out of office. The king from Elton I intend to steal and sit at the chiefest stern of public wheel. Mars is true moving, even in the heaven as in the earth, to this day is unknown to us. Late did he shine upon the English side. Now we are victors. Upon us he smiles. What towns of any moment but we have? At pleasure here we lie at Orleans. Otherwise the famished f English, like pale ghosts, faintly besiege us one hour in a month. They want their porridge and their fat bull beans. Either they must be dieted like mules and have their provender tied to their mouths, or piteous they will look, like drowned mice. Let's raise the siege. Why live we idly here? Talbot is taken whom we want to fear. Remaineth none but mad-brained Salisbury, and he may well in fretting spend his gold. Nor men nor money hath he to make war. Sound, sound alarum! We will rush on them. Now for the honor of the forlorn French. Him I forgive my death that killeth me when he sees me go back one foot or fly.
saw the like. What men have I? Dogs, cowards, dastards. I would never have fled but that they left me midst my enemies. Salisbury is a desperate homicide. He fighteth as one weary of life. The other lords, like lions wanting food, do rush upon us as their hungry prey. One to ten. Lean, raw-boned rascals. Who would e'er suppose they had such courage and audacity? Let's leave this town, for they are harebrained sleeves, and hunger will force them to be more eager. Of old I know them, rather with their teeth the wall their walls they'll tear down than forsake the siege. Be it so. Where's the Prince Dauphin? I have news for him. Bastard of Orleans, thrice welcome to us. Methinks your looks are sad, your cheer appalled. Hath the late overthrow wrought this offense? Be not dismayed, for succor is at hand. <coughs> a holy maid hither with me I bring, which by a vision sent to her from heaven, ordained is to raise this tedious siege and drive the English forth the bounds of France. The spirit of deep prophecy she hath, exceeding the nine sibyls of old Rome. What's past and what's to come she can describe. Speak, shall I call her in? Believe no. my words, for they are certain and unfallible. Go call her in. But first, to try her skill, Alençon, stand thou as Do Dauphin in my place, question her proudly, thy looks be stern, by this means shall we sound what skill she hath. Fair maid, if thou wilt do these wondrous feats. Alençon, is it thou that thinkest to beguile me? Where is the Dauphin? Oh, come, come, from behind, I know thee well, though never seen before. Be not amazed, there's nothing hid from me. In private will I talk with thee apart. Stand back, you lords, and give us leave a while. She takes upon her bravely at first dash. Dauphin, I am by birth a shepherd's daughter, my wit untrained in any kind of art. Heaven and Our Lady gracious hath it pleased to shine on my contemptible estate. Lo, no, whilst I waited on my tender lambs, and to sun's parching heat displayed my cheeks, God's mother deigned to appear to me, and in a vision full of majesty, willed me to leave my base vocation and free my country of calamity. Her aid she promised and assured success. In complete glory she revealed herself. Ask me what question thou canst possible, and I will answer unpremeditated my courage. Try by combat if thou darest, and thou shalt find that I exceed my sex. Resolve on this. Thou shalt be fortunate if thou receive me for thy warlike mate. Thou hast astonished me with thy high terms. Only this proof of thy valor make. In single combat shalt thou buckle with me, and if thou vanquishest, thy words are true. Otherwise I renounce all confidence. I am prepared. Here is my keen-edged sword. <laughs> Then come a God's name. I fear no woman. And while I live, I'll ne'er fly from a man. Stay, stay thy hand. Thou fightest like an Amazon, and fightest with the sword of Deborah. Christ's mother helps me, ere I were too weak. Whoever helps thee, tis thou that must help me. Impatiently I burn with thy desire. My heart and hands thou hast at once subdued. Excellent Pucel, if thy name be so, let me thy servant and not sovereign be. Tis the French Dauphin suest thee thus. I must not yield to any rights of love, for my profession's sacred from above. When I have chased all thy foes from hence, then will I think upon recompense. Meantime, look gracious on thy prostrate throng. My lord, what devise you on? Shall we give over Orleans, or no? Why, no, I say, distrustful recreants, fight to the last gasp. I will be your guard. <laughs> what she says, I'll, cons I'll confirm. We'll fight it out. Assigned <laughs> am I to be the English scourge. This night the siege assuredly I'll raise. Glory is like a circle in the water, which never ceaseth to enlarge itself, till by broad spreading it dispersed to naught. With Henry's death, the English circle ends. Dispersed are the glories it included. Woman, do what thou canst to save our honors. 
Try them from Orleans and be immortalized. Presently we'll come. We'll try. Come. Let's away about it. No prophet will I trust if she prove false. Place produced they me to be a public spectacle to all. 
here, said they, is the terror of the French, the scarecrow that affrights our children so. <laughs> then broke I from the officers that led me, and with my nails dig stones out of the ground to hurl at the beholders of my shame. My grisly countenance made others fly. <laughs> None durst come near for fear of sudden death. In iron walls, uh, in iron walls they deem me not secure. So great fear of my name amongst them was spread that they supposed I could rend bars of steel and spurn in pieces posts of adamant. <laughs> Wherefore a guard of chosen shot I had that walked about me every minute while, and if I did but stir out of my bed, ready they were to shoot me to the heart. <laughs> stir is this? What tumult in the heaven? Whence cometh this alarm and the noise? My lord, my lord, the French have gathered head. <clears throat> Dauphin with one Joan La Pousselle joined. A holy prophetess, new risen up, has come with great power to raise the siege. Pousselle or Pousselle, dolphin or dogfish, your hearts I'll stamp out with my horse's heels and make a quagmire of your mingled brains. We will try what these dastard Frenchmen dare. Retire, I cannot stay them. A woman clad in armor chaseth them. Here, here she comes. I'll have a bout with thee. Devil or devil's dam, I'll conjure thee. Blood will I draw on thee. Thou art a witch, and straightway give thy soul to him that serves. Come, come. Tis only I that must disgrace thee. For hell so to prevail, my breast all burst with straining of my current, and from my shoulders crack my arms asunder. But I will chastise this high minded strumpet. Talbot, farewell. Thy hour is not yet come. I must go victual to Orleans forthwith. Or take me if thou canst, I scorn thy strength. This day is ours, as many more shall be. My thoughts are whirled like a potter's wheel. I know not where I am, nor what I do. A witch, by fear, not force like Hannibal, drives back our troops and conquers as she lists. What? Countrymen, either renew the fight or tear the lions out of England's coat. It will not be. Retire into your trenches. Pucel is entered into Orleans. In spite of us or aught that we could do. The shame thereof will make me hide my head. Advance our waving colors on the walls. Rescued is Orléans from the English. Thus Joan La Pucelle hath performed her word. Divinest creature, how shall I honor thee for this success? France, triumph in thy glorious prophetess. Recovered is the town of Orleans. A more blessed hap did ne'er befall our state. Why ring not out the bells aloud throughout the town? Dauphin, command the citizens to make bonfires and feast and banquet in the open streets to celebrate the joy that God hath given us. All France will be replete with mirth and joy when they shall hear how we have played the men. Tis Joan and not we by whom the day is won. 
for which I will divide my crown with her, and all the priests and friars of my realm shall in procession sing her endless praise. In memory of her, when she is dead, her ashes in an urn more precious than rich jeweled of Darius. Transported shall be at high festivals before the kings and queens of France. But Joan La Pucelle shall be France's saint. No longer on Saint Denis shall we cry. Come in and let us banquet royally after this golden day of victory. Sirs, take your places and be vigilant. If any noise or soldier you perceive near to the walls, by some apparent sign, let us have knowledge at the court of God. Sergeant, you shall. Thus our poor servitors, while others sleep upon their quiet beds, constrained to walk in darkness, rain, and cold. Huh. Lord Regent! and redoubted Burgundy, by whose approach the regions of Artois, Wallon, and Picardy are friends to us. This happy night the Frenchmen are secure, having all day caroused and banqueted. Embrace we then this opportunity, as fitting best to Quintin's their deceit, contrived by art of baleful sorcery. Coward of France, how much he wrongs his fame, despairing of his own arms' fortitude, to join with witches and the help of hell. Traitors have never other company, but what's that to sell they term so pure? A maid, they say. A maid, and be so martial. <laughs> pray, pray God she'd prove not masculine ere long, if underneath the standard of French she carry armor as she hath begun. Well, let them practice and converse with spirits. God is our fortress, in whose conquering name let us resolve to scale their flinty bulwarks. Ascend, brave Talbot, we will follow thee. Not altogether. Better far, I guess, that we do make our entrance several ways that if it chance the one of us do fail, the others yet may rise against our force. Agreed, I'll to yon corner, and I'll to this. And here will Talbot mount, or make his grave. St. George! A Talbot! Oh, the enemy has taken us off! Unready, aye, and glad we escaped so well. It was time I crowed awake and leave our beds, hearing alarms at our chamber doors. Of all exploits, since first I followed arms, ne'er heard I the warlike enterprise more venturous or desperate than this. I think this Talbot be a fiend of hell. If not of hell, the heavens sure favor him. Oh, here comes Charles. I marvel how he sped. Is this thy cunning, thou deceitful dame? Didst thou at first, to flatter us withal, Make us partakers of a little gain that thou that are lost that might be ten times so much. Wherefore is Charles impatient with his friend? At all times will you have my power or life, sleeping or waking, must I still prevail? Or will you blame and lay the fault on me? Improvident soldiers! Had your watch been good, this sudden mischief never could have fallen. Duke of Alençon, this was your default that being captain of the watch tonight did not did look no better at the weighty challenge. Had all our your quarters been as safely kept as that whereof I had the government, we had not been thus shamefully surprised. Mine was secure. And so was mine, my lord. Question, my lords, no further of this case, him or which way, to sure they found some place but weakly guarded, where the breach was made. And now there rests no other shift but this, to gather our soldiers, scattered and dispersed, and lay new platforms to endamage them. I'll be so bold to take what they have left. I've the cry Talbot served me for a sword. Pride loaded me with many spoils, using no other weapon but his name. <laughs> Muse, we met not with the Dauphin's grace, his new come champion, virtuous Joan of Arc, nor any of his false confederates. Tis thought, Lord Talbot, when the fight began, roused on the sudden from their drowsy beds, 
they did amongst the troops of armed men leap all the walls for refuge in the field. <laughs> Myself, as far as I could discern, for smoke and dusky vapors of the night, I am sure I scared the Dauphin and end his troll that could not live us under day or night. After that, things are set in order here. We'll follow them with all the power we have. Yes. <laughs> Lords and gentlemen, what means this silence? Dare no man answer in a case of truth. Within the temple hall we were too loud. The garden here is more convenient. Then say it once if I maintain the truth, or else was wrangling Somerset in the error. Faith, I have been a truant in the law, and never yet could frame my will to it, and therefore frame the law unto my will. <laughs> Did you judge you, my lord Warwick, then, between us? Between two hawks, which flies the higher pitch? Between two dogs, which hath the deeper mouth? Between two blades, which bears the better temper? Between two horses, which doth bear him best? Between two girls, which hath the merriest eye? I have perhaps some shallow spirit of judgment, but in these nice sharp quillets of the law, good faith, I am no wiser than a dog. Tut, tut, here is a mannerly forbearance. The truth appears so naked on my side that any purblind eye could find it out. And on my side, it is so well apparelled so clear, so shining, and so evident that it will glimmer through a blind man's eye. Since you are tongue-tied and so loath to speak, in dumb significance proclaim your thoughts. Let him that is a true-born gentleman and stands upon the honor of his birth, if he suppose that I have pleaded truth, from off this briar, pluck a white rose with me. Let him that is no coward nor no flatterer, but dare maintain the party of the truth Pluck a red rose from off this thorn with me. I love no colors, and without all color of base insinuating flattery, I pluck this white rose with Plantagenet. I pluck this red rose with good Somerset, and say withal, I think he held the right. Stay, lords and gentlemen, and pluck no more, till you conclude that he upon whose side the fewest roses are cropped from the tree shall yield the other in right opinion. Good Master Vernon, it is well objected. If I have fewest, I subscribe in silence. And I? Then, for the truth and plainness of the case, I pluck this pale and made them blossom here, and give my verdict on the white rose side. Prick not your finger as you pluck it off, lest bleeding you do paint the white rose red and fall on my side, so uh, against your will. If I, my lord, for my opinion bleed, opinion shall be surgeon to my hurt, and keep me on the side where still I am. Well, well, come on. Who else? And lest my study and my books be false, the argument you held was wrong in you. In sign whereof, I pluck a white rose too. Now, Somerset, where is your argument? Here in my scabbard, meditating that shall dye your white rose in a bloody red. Meantime, your cheeks do counterfeit our roses, for pale they look with fear, as witnessing the truth on our side. No, Plantagenet, tis not for fear, but anger, that thy cheeks blush for pure shame to counterfeit our roses, and yet thy tongue will not confess thy error. Hath not thy rose a canker, Somerset? Hath not thy rose a thorn, Plantagenet? Aye, sharp and piercing, to maintain his truth, whilst thy consuming canker eats his falsehood. Well, I'll find friends to wear my bleeding roses that shall maintain what I have said is true, where false Plantagenet dare not be seen. Now, by God's will, thou wrongst him, Somerset. His grandfather was Lionel, Duke of Clarence, third son to the third Edward, King of England, spring crestless yeoman from so deep a root. He bears him on the place's privilege, or durst not for his craven heart say thus. By him that made me, I'll maintain my words on any plot of ground in Christendom. Was not thy father, Richard, Earl of Cambridge, for treason executed in our late king's days? And by his treason, stepst thou not a tainted, corrupted, and exempt from ancient gentry? His trespass yet lives guilty in thy blood, and till thou be restored, thou art a yeoman. My father was attached, not attainted. Condemned to die for treason, but no traitor. That I'll prove on better men than Somerset, were growing time once ripened to my will. Aye, thou shalt find us ready for thee still, and know us by these colors for thy foes.
For these, my friends, in spite of thee, shall wear. And by my soul, this pale and angry rose is cognizance of my blood-drinking hate. Will I forever in my faction wear until it wither with me into my grave, or flesh to the height of my degree? Go forward and be choked with thy ambition, and so farewell until I meet thee next. Have with thee, Paul. Farewell, ambitious Richard. How I am braved and must perforce endure it. This blood that they object against your house shall be wiped out in the next parliament called for the truce of Winchester and Gloucester. And if thou be not then created York, I will not live to be accounted Warwick. Meantime, in signal of my love to thee, against proud Somerset and William Pole, will I upon thy party wear this rose. And here I prophesy, this brawl today, grown to this faction in the temple garden, shall send between the red rose and the white a thousand souls to death and deadly night. Good Master Vernon, I am bound to you that you on my behalf would pluck a flower. In your behalf still I will I wear the same. And so will I. Thanks, gentle sir. Come, let us pour to dinner. I dare say this quarrel will drink blood another day. deep premeditated lines, with written pamphlets, studiously devised, Humphrey of Gloucester, that thou canst accuse, or aught intents to lay unto charge, do it without invention. Suddenly, as I, with sudden and extemporal speech, propose to answer what thou canst object. Presumptuous priest, this place commands my presence. For thou shouldst find thou hast dishonored me. Think not, although in writing I preferred the manner of thy vile, outrageous crimes, that therefore I have forged, or am not able, for Burton, to rehearse the method of my pen. No, prelate, such is thy audacious wickedness, thy lewd, festiferous, and licentious pranks, as very infants prattled of thy pride. Thou art a most pernicious usurer, forward by nature, enemy to peace, lascivious, wanton, more than well beseems a man of thy profession and degree. And for thy treachery, what's more manifest in that thou didst slay a trap to take my life, as well at London Bridge as at the Tower. Besides, I fear me, if thy thoughts were sifted, the king, Thy sovereign is not quite exempt from the envious malice of thy swelling heart. Gloucester, I do defy thee, Lord Faust Chafe, to give me hearing what I shall reply if I were covetous, ambitious, or perverse, as he will have me, how am I so poor? Or how haps if I seek not to advance or raise myself, but keep my wanted calling? And as for dissension, who prefereth peace more than I do? <laughs> Except I be provoked. No, my good lord, it is not that offends. It is not that hath incensed the duke. It is because no one should sway but he. No one but he should be about the king. And that engenders thunder in his breast and makes him roar these accusations forth, because he shall know I am as good as thou bastard of my grandfather. I lordly sir, for what you are, I pray, but one imperious in another's throne. Am I not protector, saucy priest? Am I not a prelate of the church? Yes, as an outlaw in a castle keeps and uses it to patronage his theft. Unreverent Gloucester. Thou art reverent, touching thy spiritual function. Not Rome, thy life. Rome shall remedy this. Rome thither then. <laughs> my lord, it were your duty to forbear. Aye, see the bishop be not overborne. Methinks my lord should be religious and know the office that belongs <laughs> to such. Methinks his lordship should be humbler. It fitteth not a prelate so to plead. Yes, when his holy state is touched so near. State holy or unhallowed, what of that? Is not his great protector to the king? Plantagenet, I see, must hold his tongue. Lest it be said, speak, sirrah, when you should. Must your bold verdict enter talk with lords? Else when I have a fling of Winchester. Uncles of Gloucester and of Winchester, the special watchmen of our English wheels, 
I would prevail, if prayers might prevail, to join your hearts in love and amity. Oh, what a scandal is it to our crown that two such noble peers as ye should jar. Civil dissension is a viper's worm that gnaws at the bowels of the commonwealth. What tumult's this? An uproar, I dare warrant, begun through malice of the bishop's men. So, so. Lords and virtuous Henry, pity the city of London, pity us. The bishop of Gloucester, Duke of Gloucester's men, forbidden late to carry any weapon, have filled their pockets full of pebble stones, and banding themselves in contrary parts, do felt so fast at one another's pate, that many have their giddy brains knocked out. Our, win our windows are broke down in every street, and we for fear compelled to shut our shops. We charge you on allegiance to our set to hold your slaughtering hands and keep the peace. I pray, Uncle Blossom, mitigate this strife. Nay, if we be forbidden stones, we'll fall to it with our teeth. We are as resolute. You of my household, leave this peevish broil and set aside this unaccustomed fight. Oh, how this discord doth affect my soul. Can you, my lord of Winchester, behold my sighs and tears and will not once relent? Who should be pitiful if you be not? Or who should study to prefer a peace if holy churchmen take delight in broils? Yield, my lord protector. Yield, Winchester, except you mean with obstinate repulse to slay your sovereign and destroy the realm. He shall submit, or I will never yield. Passion on the king commands me to stoop, or I would never see his heart out ere the priest should ever get the grip of me. Behold, my lord of Winchester, the duke hath banished moody discontented fury, as by his smoothed brows it doth appear. Why look you still so stern and tragical? Dear Winchester, I offer thee my hand. Fie, Uncle Beaufort, I have heard you preach that, grief, that, that malice was a great and grievous sin. And will you not maintain the thing you teach, but prove a chief offender in the same? Sweet king, the bishop hath a kindly gird. For shame, my lord of Winchester, relent! Well, Duke of Gloucester! I will yield to thee, love for thy love, and hand for hand I give. I, I fear me with a hollow heart. See here, my friends and loving countrymen, this token serveth for a flag of truth betwixt ourselves and all our followers. So help me God, as I dissemble not. So help me God, as I intend not. O oh, loving uncle! Kind Duke of Gloucester, how joyful am I made by this contract. Accept this scroll, most gracious sovereign, which in the right of Richard Plantagenet we do exhibit to your majesty. Well urged, my lord Warwick, O oh, sweet prince, and if your grace mark every circumstance, you have great reason to do Richard right, especially for those occasions at Eltham Palace <laughs> I told your majesty. And those occasions, uncle, were of force. Therefore, my loving lords, our pleasure is that Richard be restored to his blood. Let Richard be restored to his blood, so shall his father's wrongs be recompensed. And so, as will the rest, so will Winchester. If Richard will be true, not that alone, but all the whole inheritance I give that doth belong unto the house of York, from which you spring by lineal descent. Thy humble servant vows obedience and humble service till the point of death. Stoop then, and set your knee against my foot, and in regurgion of that duty done, I gird thee with the valiant sword of York. Rise, Richard, like a true Plantagenet, and rise, created princely Duke of York. And so thrive, Richard, as thy foes may fall. And as my duty springs, so perish they, they grudge one thought against your majesty. Welcome, Welcome my, my prince. 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 Come my mighty Duke, Duke, Duke of York. Perish, base prince, ignoble Duke of York. Now will it best avail your majesty to cross the seas and to be crowned in France. The presence of a king 
engenders love amongst his subjects and loyal friends as it disanimates his enemies. When Gloucester says the word, King Henry goes, for friendly counsel cuts off many foes. Your ships are already in readiness. Aye. We may march in England or in France, not seeing what is likely to ensue. This late dissension growing betwixt the peers burns beneath our feigned ashes of a forged love, and must at last break out into a flame, as festering members rot but by degrees, this breeding discord breed. Now, I fear that fatal prophecy which in the time of Henry named the fifth was in the mouth of every sucking babe that Henry born in Monmouth should win all and Henry born in Windsor should lose all. It is so plain that Exeter doth wish his days might finish ere that hapless time. are the city gates, the gates of Rouen, through which our policy must make a breach. Take heed, be wary how you place your words. Talk like the vulgar sort of market men that come to gather their money for corn. If we have entrance, as I hope we shall, and that we find the slope or watch but weak, I'll by a sign give notice to our friends that Charles the Dauphin may encounter them. Our sacks shall be a means to sack the city. Then we be lords and rulers over all. Therefore, we'll not. Who is there? Peasants, poor men of France, poor market folks that come to sell their corn. Enter, go in, the market bell is rung. Now, one, I'll shake thy bulwarks to the ground. <laughs> St. Denis blessed this stratagem and will once again sleep secure in Rouen. Here entered Pucella to practice it. Now she is there, how will she specify where is the best and safest passage in? By thrusting out a torch from yonder tower, which, once discerned, shows that her meaning is no way to that for weakness which she entered. Behold, this is the happy wedding torch that joined Rouen unto our countrymen, but burning fatal to the Talbotites. See, noble Charles, the beacon of our friend. The burning torch in yonder turret stands. Now shine it like a comet of revenge, a prophet of the fall of all our foes. Defer no time, relays of dangerous end. Enter and cry the Dauphin presently, and then do execution on the watch. <laughs> treason with thy tears, if Talbot but survive thy treachery. Pucel, that witch, that damned sorceress, hath wrought this hellish mischief unawares, that hardly we escape the pride of France. Good morrow, gallants. Want ye corn for bread? I think the Duke of Burgundy will fast before he'll buy again at such a rate. Scoff on, vile fiend and shameless courtesan. I trust ere long to choke thee with thine horn and make thee curse the harvest of that corn. <laughs> Your grace may starve perhaps before that time. Oh, let no one but these revenge this treason. What will you do, good Greybeard? Break a lance and run a tilt to death within a chair? Foul fiend of France, and hag of all despite, becomes it thee to taunt his valiant age and twit with cowardice a man half dead? Damsel, I'll have a bout with you again, or else, or else let Talbot perish with his shame. Are ye so hot, sir? Yet, Pucelle, hold thy peace. 
If tall the dew but thunder, rain will follow. <laughs> Godspeed, the parliament. Who shall be the speaker? Dare ye come forth and meet us in the field? Belike your lordship takes us then for fools to try that if our own be ours or no. I speak not to that railing Hecate, but unto thee, Alanson, will ye like soldiers come and fight it out? Senor? No. <laughs> Senor? Hang! Base muleteers of France. Like peasant footboys do they keep the walls and dare not take up arms like gentlemen. God be with you, my lord. We came but to tell you that we are here. And there will we be too, ere it be long, or else reproach be Talbot's greatest fame. Thou, Burgundy, by honor of thy house, pricked on by public wrongs, sustained in France, either to get the town again or die. And I, as sure as English Henry lives, and as his father here was conqueror, as sure as in this late betrayed town, great Coeur de Leon's heart was buried, so sure I swear to get the town or die. My vows are equal with thy vows. <sighs> This is a double honor, Burgundy. Yet heavens have glory for this victory. Warlike and Marshal Talbot, Burgundy enshrines thee with his heart and there erects, erects a monument to thy noble deeds. Thanks, gentle Duke. But where is Pucelle now? I think her old familiar is asleep. Huh. Now where's the bastard's brave? And Charles his gleek? What? All a more? Oh. Rouen hangs her head for grief that such a valiant company are fled. Now will we take some order in the town, placing therein some expert officers, and then depart to Paris to the king, for there young Henry with his nobles lies. Dismay not, princes, at this accident, nor grieve that Rouen is so recovered. Care is no cure, but rather corrosive for things that are not to be remedied. Let frantic Talbot try him for a while and like a peacock sweep along his tail, we'll pull his plumes out and take away his train, if the Dauphin and the rest will be but ruled. We have been guided by thee hitherto, and of thy cunning have had no diffidence. One sudden foil shall never breed distrust. Search out thy wit for secret policies, and we will make thee famous through the world. We'll set thy statue in some holy place and have thee reverenced like a blessed saint. Employ thee then, sweet virgin, for our good. Thus it must be, this doth Joan devise. By fair persuasions mixed with sugared words, we will entice the Duke of Burgundy to leave the Talbot and to follow us. I marry, sweeting, if we could do that, France were no place for Henry's warriors. Nor should that nation boast it so with us, but be extirpted from our provinces. Forever should they be expulsed from France, and not have title of an earldom here. Your honor shall perceive how I will work to bring this matter to the wished end. Hark! By the sound of drums you may perceive their powers are marching unto Parisward. There goes the Talbot, with his colors spread, and the troops of the English after him. Okay, now in the rearward, Comes the Duke and his. Fortune and favor make him lag behind. Summon a parley. We will talk with him. A parley with the Duke of Burgundy. Who craves a parley with the Duke of Burgundy? The princely Charles of France, thy countryman. What sayest thou, Charles, for I am marching thence? Speak, Pucelle, and enchant him with thy words. Brave Burgundy, undoubted hope of France. Stay, let thy humble handmaid speak to thee. Speak on, but be not over tedious. Look on thy country. Look on fertile France. And see the cities and the towns defaced by the wasting ruin of the cruel foe, as looks the mother on her lowly babe when death doth close his tender dying eyes. See? See the pining malady of France? Behold the wounds, the most unnatural wounds, 
which thou thyself hast given her. Woeful breast, oh, turn thy edged sword another way. Strike those that hurt, and hurt not those that help. One drop of blood drawn from thy country's bosom should grieve thee more than streams of foreign gore. Return thee, therefore, with a flood of tears, and wash away thy country's stained spots. Either she hath bewitched me with her words, or, or nature suddenly makes me relent. Besides, all French and France exclaims on thee, doubting thy birth and lawful progeny, who jointest thou with but a lordly nation that will not trust thee but for profit's sake? When Talbot hath set footing once in France and fashioned thee that instrument of ill, who then but English Henry will be lord, and thou be thrust out like a fugitive? Call we to mind, and mark this but for proof. Was not the Duke of Orléans thy foe? Was he not in England prisoner? But when they heard he was thine enemy, they set him free, without his ransom paid, in spite of Burgundy and all his friends. See then, thou fightst against thy countrymen, and joinst with them will be thy slaughtermen. Come, come, return. Return, thou wandering lord. Charles and the rest will take thee in their arms. I am vanquished. These haughty words of her have battered me like the roaring cannon shot and made me almost yield upon my knees. Uh, forgive me, country, and sweet countrymen, and lords, accept this hearty kind of embrace. My forces and my, my power of men are yours. So, farewell, Talbot. I'll no longer trust thee. Done like a Frenchman, turn and turn again. Welcome, brave Duke. <laughs> Thy friendship makes us fresh. And doth beget new courage in our breasts. Whosell hath bravely played her part in this, and doth deserve a coronet of gold. And now let us on, my lords, and join our powers, and seek how we may prejudice the foe. given truce unto my wars, to do my duty to my sovereign. In sign whereof this arm, that hath reclaimed to your obedience fifty fortresses, twelve cities, and seven walled towns of strength, besides five hundred prisoners of esteem, lets fall his sword before your highness's feet. And with submissive loyalty of heart, ascribes the glory of his conquest, Scott, first to my God, and next unto your grace. Is this Lord Talbot, Uncle Gloucester, who has so long been resident in France? Yes, if it please your majesty, my liege. Welcome, brave captain and victorious lord. I do remember how my father said a stouter champion never handled sword. Long since we were resolved of your truth, your faithful service, and your toil in war, yet never have you tasted our reward, or been regurgent with so much as thanks, because Till now, we never saw your face. And for these good desserts, we here create you Earl of Shrewsbury, and in our coronation, take your place. Now, sir, to you that were so hot at sea, disregarding these colors that I wear in honor of my noble Lord of York, darest thou maintain the former words thou spakest? Yes, sir, as well as you, <coughs> as well as you dare patronage the envious barking of your saucy tongue against my lord, the Duke of Somerset. Sarah, thy lord I honor as he is. Why, what is he, as good a man as your... Hark ye, so not in witness, take ye that. Villain, thou knowst the law of arms is such that whoso draws a sword is present death or else this blow should broach thy dearest blood. But all unto his majesty in crave I may have liberty to revenge this wrong. When thou shalt see, I'll meet thee to thy cost. Well, miscreant, I'll be there as soon as you, and after meet you sooner than you would. Set the crown upon his head. Got 
St. King Henry, of that name, the Sixth. Now, Governor of Paris, take your oath that you elect no other king but him, esteem none friends but such as are his friends, and none your foes but such as shall pretend malicious practices against his state. This shall you do, so help you, righteous God, sent from our uncle, Duke of Burgundy. What, what means his grace that he hath changed his style? No more but plain and bluntly to the king. Hath he forgot he is his sovereign? Or doth this churlish superscription pretend some alteration in goodwill? Eh, what's here? I have, upon a special cause, Move with compassion of my country's wreck, together with a pitiful complaint of such as your oppression feeds upon, forsaken your pernicious faction and joined with Charles, the rightful king of France. Oh, monstrous treachery, can this be so, that in alliance, amity, and oath, there should be found such false dissembling guile? What, does my uncle Burgundy revolt? He doth, my lord and is become your foe. Is that the worst this letter doth contain? It is the worst, and all, my lord, he writes. Why then, Lord Talbot, thou shalt talk with him, and give him chastisement for this abuse. How say you, my lord, are you not content? Content, my liege? Yes, but that I am prevented, I should have begged I might have been employed. Then gather strength and march unto him straight. Let him perceive how ill we brook this treason, and what offense it is to flout his friends. I go, my lord. In heart desiring still, you may behold confusion of your foes. Grant me combat, gracious sovereign. And me, my lord, grant me the combat too. This is my servant, hear him, sweet prince. And this is mine, sweet Henry, favor him. Be patient, lords, and give them leave to speak. Say, gentlemen, what makes you thus exclaim? And wherefore crave you combat, or with whom? With him, my lord, for he hath done me wrong. And I with him, for he hath done me wrong. Uh, what is the wrong there if you both complain? First let me know, then I'll answer you. Crossing the sea from England into France, this fellow here with envious, carting hump, upbraided me about the roads I wear, saying the sanguine color of the leaves did represent my master's blushing cheeks, when stubbornly he did repugn the truth about a certain question in the law argued betwixt the Duke of York and him, with other vile and ignominious terms in confutation of which rude reproach, and in defense of my lord's worthiness, I crave the benefit of law and arm. And that is my petition, noble lord, for though he seems with forged quaint conceit to set a gloss upon his bold intent, yet no, my lord, I was provoked by him, and he first took exceptions with, at this badge, pronouncing that the paleness of this flower bewrayed the faintness of my master's heart. Will not this malice Somerset be left? Your part, private grudge, my lord, of York will out, though ne'er so cunningly you smother it. Good lord, what madness rules in brain-sick men, when for so slight and frivolous a cause such factious emulation shall arise. Good cousins both of York and Somerset, quiet yourselves, I pray, and be at peace. Let this dissension first be tried by fight, and then your highness shall command the peace. The quarrel toucheth none but us alone. Betwixt ourselves, let us decide it then. There is my pledge. Accept it, Somerset. But nay, let it begin where, where, let it end where it first began. Confirm it so, my honorable lord. Confirm it so. Confounded be your strife, and perish ye with your gaseous prate, presumptuous vassals. Are you not ashamed with this immodest, clamorous outrage? to trouble and disturb the king and us. And you, my lords, methinks you do not well to bear with their perverse objections, much less to take occasions from their mouths, to raise a mutiny between yourselves. Let me persuade you to take a better course. It grieves his highness. Good, my lord, be friends. Come hither, you that would be combatants. 
Henceforth I charge you, as you love our favor, quite to forget this quarrel and the cause. And you, my lords, remember where we are, in France, amongst a fickle, wavering nation. If they perceive dissension in our looks, and that within ourselves we disagree, how will their grudging stomachs be provoked to willful disobedience and rebel? Beside what infamy will there arise when foreign princes shall be certified that for a thing of no regard, that for a toy, King Henry's peers and chief nobility destroyed themselves and lost the realm of France. Let me be umpire in this doubtful strife. I see no reason, if I wear this rose, that anyone should therefore be more suspicious, I am more inclined to Somerset than York. Both are my kinsmen, and I love them both. But your discretion better can persuade than I am able to instruct or teach. And therefore, as we hither came in peace, so let us still continue peace and love. Cousin of York, we institute your grace to be our regent in the parts of France. And good my lord of Somerset, unite your troops of horsemen with his bands of foot. And like true subjects, sons of your progenitors, go cheerfully together and digest your angry collar on your enemies. Ourself, my lord protector, and the rest, after some rest respite, will return to Calais. From thence to England, where I hope ere long to be presented by your victories with Charles Alanson in that traitorous rout. My lord of York, I promised you the king prettily methought it played the orator. And so he did, but yet I like it not in that he wears the badge of Somerset. Hush, that was but his fancy. Blame him not. I dare presume, sweet prince, he thought no harm. And if I wished he did, oh, but let it rest. Other affairs must now be managed. Well didst thou, Richard, to suppress thy voice, for had the passions of thy heart burst forth, I fear we should have seen deciphered there more rancorous spite, more furious raging broils than yet can be imagined or supposed. But howsoever, no simple man that sees the charring discord of nobility, this shouldering of each other in the courts, this factious bandying of their favorites, but it, that it doth presage some ill event. Tis much when scepters are in children's <coughs> hands, but more when envy be breeds unkind confusion. There comes, there comes the ruin, there begins confusion. Go to the gates of Bordeaux, trumpeter. Summon their general unto the wall. English John Talbot, captains, calls you forth, servant in arms to Harry, King of England, and thus he would. Open your city gates. Be humble to us. Call my sovereign yours and do him homage as obedient subjects, and I'll withdraw me and my bloody power. But if you frown upon this proffered peace, you tempt the fury of my three attendants, lean famine, quartering steel, and climbing fire who in a moment, even with the earth, shall lay your stately and air-braving towers if you forsake the offer of their love. Thou ominous <clears throat> and fearful hour of death, <clears throat> our nation's terror and their bloody scourge, the period of thy tyranny approaches. On us thou canst not enter but by death, for I protest we are well fortified and strong enough to issue out in fight. If thou retire, Dolphin, well appointed, stands with the snares of war to tangle thee. And no way canst thou turn thee for redress, but death doth front thee with apparent spoil and pale 
all destruction seeks thee in thy face. Lo, there thou stands, a breathing, valiant man, of an invincible, unconquered spirit. This is the latest glory of thy praise, that I, thy enemy, do thee with all. For ere the glass that now begins to run, finish the process of his envy hour. These eyes that see thee now well colored shall see thee withered, bloody, pale, and dead. Hark! Hark the Dauphin's drum! A warning bell sings heavy music to thy heavy, timorous soul, and mine shall ring thy dire departure out. He fables not. I hear the enemy. Out! Some light horsemen and peruse their way. God and St. George, Talbot and England's right, prosper our colors in this dangerous fight! Again, the dog, the mighty army of the Dauphin. They are returned, my lord, and do that. The keys march to Bordeaux with his powers to fight his power. As he marched along by a two edged bow, were discovered two mightier troops than the Dauphin led, which joined with them and made their march to Bordeaux. Plague upon that villain Somerset! It thus delays my promised supply of horsemen that were levied for this siege. Renowned in Talbot doth expect my aid. And I am louted by a traitor villain, and cannot help the noble chevalier. God comfort him in this necessity. If he miscarry, farewell wars in France. Thou princely leader of our English strength, spur to the rescue of our noble Talbot, who now is girdled with a waist of iron and hemmed about with grim destruction to Bordeaux, warlike. Duke to Bordeaux, York, else farewell, Talbot, France and England's honor. Oh, God, that Somerset, who in proud heart did stop my cornets, were in Talbot's place. So should we save a valiant gentleman by forfeiting a traitor and a coward. Mad ire and wrathful fury makes thee weep, that thus we die while Rebus traitors sleep. Oh, send some succor to the distressed lord. He dies, we lose. I break my warlike ward. We mourn, France smiles. We lose, they daily get all long of this vile traitor Somerset. And God take mercy on brave Talbot's soul and on his young son John, who two hours since I met in travel toward his warlike father. This seven years did not Talbot see his son, and now they meet where both their lives are done. Alas, what joy shall noble Talbot have to bid his young son welcome to the grave? Away! Vexation almost stops my breath, that sons of friends greet in the hour of death. Thus, while the vulture of sedition feeds in the bosom of such great commanders, sleeping neglection doth betray to loss the conquest of our scarce cold conqueror, that ever living man of memory, Henry the Fifth, while they each other cross, lives, honors, lands, and all hurry to loss. Ah, 
by your withdrawal's emulation. Let not your private discord keep away the levied succors that should lend him aid, while he, renowned and noble gentleman, yields up his life unto a world of odds. York set him on, York should have sent him aid. And York as fast upon your grace exclaims, swearing that you withhold his levied host collected for this expedition. York lies. He might have sent and had the horse. I owe him little duty and less love, and take foul scorn to fawn on him by sending. The fraud of England, not the force of France, hath now entrapped the noble-minded Talbot. Never to England shall he bear his life, but dies betrayed to fortune by your strife. Come, go. I will dispatch the horsemen straight. Within six hours they will be at his aid. Too late comes rescue. He is ta'en or slain. For fly he would not, if he would have fled. Fly would Talbot never, though he might. If he be dead, brave Talbot, then adieu. Fame lives in the world. His shame at you. Oh, young, young John Talbot, I did send for thee to tutor thee in stratagems of war. That Talbot's name might be in thee revived when sapless age and weak, unable limbs should bring thy father to his drooping chair. But, O oh, malignant and ill-boding stars, now thou art come unto a feast of death, a terrible and unavoided danger. Therefore, dear boy, mount on my swiftest horse, and I'll direct thee how thou shalt escape by sudden flight. Come, dally not, be gone. Is my name Talbot? And am I your son? And shall I fly? Oh, if you love my mother, dishonor not her honorable name to make a bastard and a slave of me. The world will say he is not Talbot's blood that basely fled when noble Talbot stood. Fly to revenge my death if I be slain. He that flies so will never return again. If we both stay, we both are sure to die. Then let me stay. And father, do you fly? Your loss is great, so your regard should be. My worth unknown, no loss is known in me. Upon my blessing, I command thee go. To fight I will, but not to fly the foe. Part of thy father may be saved in thee. No part of him will be shame in me. Thy father's charge shall clear thee from that stain. You cannot witness for me being slain. If death be so apparent, then both fly. And leave my followers here to fight and die? My age was never tainted with such shame. And shall my youth be guilty of such blame? Then here I take my leave of thee, fair son, born to eclipse thy life this afternoon. Come, side by side, together live and die, and soul with soul, from France to heaven fly. Mm. Soldiers, fight! The regent hath with, hath with Talbot broke his word and left us to the rage of France his sword. Where is John Talbot? Pause and take thy breath. I gave thee life and rescued thee from death. Oh, twice, my father, twice am I thy son. The life thou gavest me first was lost and done. Till with thy warlike sword, despite of late, to my determined time thou gavest new date. When from the Dauphin's crest thy sword struck fire, it warmed thy father's heart with proud desire of bold-faced victory. Then, leaden age, quickened with youthful spleen and warlike rage, beat down Alençon, Orleans, Burgundy, and from the pride of Gallia rescued thee. Speak, thy father's care. Art thou not weary, John? How dost thou fare? Wilt thou yet leave the battle, boy, and fly? Now thou art sealed the son of chivalry. Fly, to revenge my death when I am dead, the help of one stands me in little stead. Before young Talbot from old Talbot fly, the coward horse that fails me and die, and liken me to the peasant boys of France, to be shame scorn and subject of this chance. Surely by all the glory you have won, and if I fly, I am not Talbot's son. Then talk no more of flight, it is no boot. If son to Talbot, die at Talbot's foot. And follow thou thy desperate sire of creep. <laughs> thou Icarus, thy life to me is sweet. If thou wilt fight, 
fight by thy father's side, and commendable proved, let's die in pride. John, triumphant death, smear, smeared with captivity. Young Talbot's valor makes me smile at thee. When he perceived me shrink and on my knee, his bloody sword he brandished over me, and like a hungry lion did commence rough deeds of rage and stern impatience. But when my angry garden stood alone, tendering my ruin and assailed of none, dizzy-eyed fury and great rage of heart suddenly made him from my side to start into the clustering battle of the French. And in that sea of blood, my boy did drench his overmounting spirit. And there died my Icarus, my blossom in his pride. Oh, my lord, look where your son is born. Thou antic death, which last us here to scorn. Anon, from thy insulting tyranny, coupled in bonds of perpetuity. Two Talbots winged through the lither sky, and in thy despite shall escape mortality. Had York and Somerset brought rescue in, we should have found a bloody day of this. How the young whelp of Talbot's raging wood did flesh his puny sword in Frenchman's blood. Once I encountered him, and thus I said, Thou maiden youth be vanquished by a maid. But with a proud, majestical high scorn, he answered thus, Young Talbot was not born to be the pillage of a jiglet wench. So, rushing in the bowels of the French, he left me proudly as unworthy fight. Doubtless he would have made a noble knight. Hew them to pieces, hack their bones asunder. Whose life was England's glory, a Gallia's wonder? Oh no, forbear. For that which we have fled during the life, let us not wrong it dead. Errol, conduct me to the Dauphin's tent to know who hath obtained the glory of the day. On what submissive message art thou sent? Submission, Dauphin. Tis a mere French word. We English warriors want not what it means. I come to know what prisoners thou hast taken and to survey the bodies of the dead. For prisoners, ask thou, hell our prison is. But tell me whom thou seekst. But where's the great Alcides of the field, valiant Lord Talbot, Earl of Shrewsbury? Him that thou magnifiest, stinking and fly-blown, lays here at our feet. Is Talbot slain, the Frenchman's only scourge, your kingdom's terror and black nemesis. Give me their bodies that I may bear them hence and give them burial as beseems their worth. For God's sake, let him have them. To keep them here, they would but stink and putrefy the air. Go take their bodies hence. I'll bear them hence. From their ashes shall be reared a phoenix that shall make all France a fear. So we be rid of them. Do with them what thou wilt. Then march to Paris, royal Charles of France, and keep not back your powers in dalliance. Success unto our valiant general, and happiness to his accomplices. What tidings send our scouts, I prithee speak? The English army that divided was into two parties is now conjoined in one, and means to give you battle presently. Somewhat too sudden, sirs, the warning is. But we will presently provide for them. Of all base passions, fear is most accursed. Command the conquest, Charles, it shall be thine. Let Henry fret, and all the world repine. Then on, my lords, and France be fortunate. Have you perused the letters from the Pope, the Emperor, and the Earl of Armagnac? I have, my lord, and their intent is this. I humbly sue unto your excellence to have a godly peace concluded of between the realms of England and of France. 
How does your grace affect their motion? Well, my good lord, and as the only means to stop effusion of our Christian blood and establish quietness on every side. I marry, uncle, for I always thought it was both impious and unnatural that such immanity and bloody strife should reign among professors of one faith. Beside, my lord, the sooner to effect a surer bind is not of amity, the Earl of Armagnac, near knit to Charles, a man of great authority in France, proffers his only daughter to your grace in marriage with a large and sumptuous dowry. A marriage, uncle? Alas, bitter is my study and my books in wanton dalliance with the paramour. Yet call the Lord Ambassador, and as you please, so let them have their answers every one. I shall be well content with any choice tends to God's glory and my country's weal. My lord, ambassadors, your several suits have been considered and debated on. Uh, and therefore we certainly resolve to draw conditions of a friendly peace, which by my lord of Winchester, we mean shall be transported presently to France. And for the proper of my lord, your master, I have informed his highness so at large as liking of the lady's virtuous gifts, her beauty, and the value of her dower, he doth intend that she shall be England's queen. An argument and proof of which contract bear her this jewel, pledge of my affection. And so, my lord protector, see them guarded and safely brought to Dover, wherein shift commit them to the fortune of the sea. Now Winchester will not submit, I trow, or be inferior to the proudest peer. Humphrey of Gloucester, thou shalt well perceive that neither in birth or for authority the bishop will be overborne by thee. I'll either make thee stoop and bend thy knee, or sack this country with a mutiny. <laughs> conquers, and the Frenchmen fly. See, they forsake me. Now the time has come that France must veil her lofty plumed crest and let her head fall into England's lap. Now, France, thy glory droopeth to the dust. she could change my shape. Change to a worse shape thou canst not be. No, oh, Charles the Dauphin is a proper man. No shape but his could please your dainty eye. A plaguing mischief light on Charles and thee. And may ye both be suddenly surprised by bloody hands and sleeping in your bed. Fell panic hag enchantress, hold thy tongue. I prithee, give me leave to curse a while. Curse miscreant when thou comest to the stake. Mine eyes. Fain would I woo her, yet 
I dare not speak. My beauty's princely majesty is such, confounds the tongue, and makes the senses rough. Say, Earl of Suffolk, if thy name be so, what ransom must I pay before I pass? For I perceive I am thy prisoner. How canst thou tell she will deny thy suit before thou makes a trial of her love? Why speak'st thou not? What ransom must I pay? She's beautiful, and therefore to be wooed. She's a woman, and therefore to be won. Wilt thou accept of ransom, yea? Fond, no. man, fond man, remember that thou hast a wife. But how can <laughs> Margaret be thy paramour? I were best to leave it. For he will not hear. There all is marred. There lies a cooling card. He talks at random, sure. The man is mad. And yet a dispensation may be had? And yet I would that you would answer me. I'll win this lady, Margaret. For whom? Why, for my king. Hush, that's a wooden thing. He talks of wood. <laughs> it is some carpenter. Yet so my fancy may be satisfied and peace established between these realms. But there remains a scruple in that too. For though her father be the king of Naples, Duke of Anjou and Maine, yet is he poor. And our nobility will scorn the match. Hear ye, Captain. Are ye not at leisure? It shall be so. Disdain they ne'er so much. Henry is youthful and will quickly yield. Madam, I have a secret to reveal. What though I be in thrall, he seems a knight and will not in any way dishonor me. Uh, lady, vouchsafe to listen what I say. Perhaps I shall be rescued by the French. And then I need not crave his courtesy. Sweet madam, give me a hearing and a cause. Tush! Women have been captivated here now. Lady, wherefore talk you so? I cry you mercy, tis but quick for quo. <laughs> <laughs> Say, gentle princess, would you not suppose your bondage happy to be made a queen? To be a queen in bondage is more vile than is a slave in base civility. Princes should be free. And so shall you, if happy England's royal king be free. Why? What concerns his freedom unto me? I'll undertake to make thee Henry's queen, to put a golden scepter in thy hand, to set a precious crown upon thy head. If thou wilt consent to be my... What? His love. I am unworthy to be Henry's wife. No, oh, gentle madam, I unworthy am to woo so fair a dame to be his wife and have no portion in the choice myself. How say you, madam? Are ye so content? I am content. Then call our captains and our colors forth, and madam, at your father's castle walls will crave a parley to confer with him. See, Renier, see, thy daughter, prisoner. To whom? To me. Suffolk, what remedy? I am a soldier and unapt to weep or to exclaim on fortune's fickleness. Yes, there is remedy enough, my lord. Consent and for thy honor give consent. Thy daughter shall be wedded to my king, whom I with pain have wooed and won thereto, and this her easy-held imprisonment hath gained thy daughter's princely liberty. Speak Suffolk as he thinks. Fair Margaret knows that Suffolk doth not flatter, face, or feign. Upon thy princely warrant, I descend to give thee answer of thy just demand. And here I will expect thy coming. Welcome, brave Earl, into our territories. Command in Anjou what thy honor pleases. Thanks, Rainier. Happy for so sweet a child, fit to be made companion with the king. What answer makes your grace unto my suit? Since thou disdain to woo her little worth, to be the princely bride of such a lord, upon condition I may quietly enjoy mine own, the country main and Anjou, free from oppression or the stroke of war, my daughter shall be Henry's, if he please. That is her ransom. I deliver her. And these two counties I will undertake your grace shall well and quietly enjoy. And I again in Henry's royal name 
as deputy unto that gracious king, give he, give thee her hand, for sign of plight of faith. Rainier of France, I give thee kingly thanks, because this is in traffic of a king. I'll over then to England with this news, and make this marriage to be solemnized. So farewell, Rainier, set this diamond safe in golden palaces as it becomes. I do embrace thee as I would embrace the Christian Prince King Henry, were he here. Farewell, my lord. Good wishes, praise, and prayer shall Suffolk ever have of Margaret. Farewell, sweet Margaret, sweet madam. But hark you, Margaret, no princely commendation to my king? Such commendations as becomes a maid, a virgin, and his servant. Say to him. Words sweetly placed and modestly directed. But madam, I must trouble you again. No loving token to his majesty. Yes, my good lord. A pure, unspotted heart. Never yet take but love, I send the king. And this with all. <laughs> that for thyself. I will not so presume to send such peevish tokens to a king. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wert thou for myself. But Suffolk, stay. Thou mayest not wander in that labyrinth. There minotaurs and ugly treasons lurk. Solicit Henry with her wondrous praise. Bethink thee on her virtues that surmount and natural graces that extinguish art. Repeat their semblance often on the seas, that when thou comest to kneel at Henry's feet, thou mayest bereave him of his wits and wonder. Bring forth that sorceress condemned to burn. This kills thy father, heart outright. Have I sought every country, far and near, and now it is my chance to find thee out? Must I behold thy timeless, cruel death? Ah, Joan, sweet daughter, I'll die with thee. Decrepit miser, basic noble wretch, I am descended of gentler blood. Thou art no father, nor no friend of mine. Fie, Joan, that thou wilt be so obstacle. God knows thou art a cause of my flesh, and for thy sake, I shed many a tear. Deny me not, Joan, I prithee, gentle Joan. Peasant of bonds, you have suborned this man of purpose to obscure my noble birth. Tis true, I gave a noble to the priest the more that I wed her mother. Kneel down, take my blessing, good girl. Wilt thou not stoop? Now cursed be the time of thy nativity. Dost thou deny thy father, cursed drab? Oh, burn her! Hanging is too good! <laughs> take her away! For she hath filled the world, lived too long to fill the world with vicious qualities. And hark ye, sirs, because she is a maid, spare for no faggots, let there be a now. Place barrels of pitch upon the fatal stake, that so her torture may be short. Then lead me hence, with whom I leave my curse. May never glorious sun reflect his beams upon the country where you make abode, but darkness and the gloomy shade of death environ you, till mischief and despair drive you to break your necks, or hang yourselves! Break thou in pieces, and consume to ashes, thou foul accursed minister of hell! Lord Regent, I do greet your excellence with letters of commission from the king. For know, my lords, the states of Christendom, moved with remorse of these outrageous broils, have earnestly implored a general peace betwixt our nation and the aspiring French, and here at hand, the Dauphin and his train approaches to confer about some matter. Is all our travail turned to this effect? After the slaughter of so many peers, so many captains, gentlemen, and soldiers, that in this quarrel have been overthrown and sold their bodies for their country's benefit, shall we at last conclude effeminate peace? Have we not lost most part of all the towns by treason, falsehood, and by treachery, our great progenitors they conquered? Oh, what? Warning, I foresee with grief the utter loss of all the realm of France. Be patient, George. If we conclude a peace, it shall be with such strict and severe covenants as little shall the Frenchmen gain thereby. Since, lords of England, it is thus agreed that peaceful truce shall be proclaimed in France, 
we come to be informed by yourselves what the conditions of that league may be. Speak, Winchester. The boiling collar chokes the hollow passage of my voice and voice. By sight of these are baleful enemies. Charles and the rest. It is enacted thus that in regard King Henry gives consent of mere compassion and of lenity to ease your country of distressful war and suffer you to breathe in fruitful peace. You shall become true liegemen to his crown, and Charles, upon condition thou wilt swear to pay him tribute, submit thyself. Thou shalt be placed as viceroy under him, and still enjoy thy regal dignity. Tis known already that I am possessed with more than half the Gallen territories, and therein reference for their lawful king. Shall I, for lucre of the rest unvanquished, detract so much from that prerogative as to be called but viceroy of the whole? No, Lord Ambassador. I'll rather keep that which I have than coveting for more be cast from possibility of all. Insulting Charles! Hast thou by secret means used ill session to obtain a league, and now the matter grows to compromise? Standest thou aloof upon comparison? Either accept the title thou usurpest, a benefit proceeding from our king, and not of any challenge of desert, or we will plague thee with incessant wars. My lord, you do not well in obstinacy to cavil in the course of this contract. If once it be neglected ten to one, we shall not find like opportunity. To say the truth, it is your policy to save your subjects from such massacre and ruthless slaughters as are daily seen by our proceeding in hostility. And therefore take this compact of a truce, although you break it when your pleasure serves. How sayest thou, Charles? Shall our condition stand? It shall. Only reserved you claim no interest in any of our towns of garrison. Then swear allegiance to his majesty, as thou art knight, never to disobey nor be rebellious to the crown of England. Thou, nor thy nobles, to the crown of England. So now dismiss your army when you please. Hang up your ensign, let your drums be still. For here, we entertain a solemn peace. noble earl, of beauty's Margaret hath astonished me. Her virtues grace it with external gifts do breed love subtle passions in my heart. Tush, my good lord, this superficial tale is but a preface of her worthy praise, but with a humble lowliness of mind she is content to be at your command. Command, I mean, of virtuous, chaste intents to love and honor Henry as her lord. And otherwise will Henry ne'er presume. Therefore, my Lord Protector, give consent that Margaret may be England's royal queen. So should I give consent to flatter sin. You know, my Lord, your Highness is betrothed unto another lady of esteem. How shall we then dispense with that contract and not deface your honor with reproach? As doth a ruler with unlawful oaths or one that as a triumph having vowed to try his strength forsaketh yet the lists by reason of his adversary's odds. A poor earl's daughter is unequal odds, and therefore may be broke without offense. Why, what I pray is Margaret more than that. Her father is no better than an earl, although in glorious titles he excels. Yes, my lord, her father is a king the king of Naples and Jerusalem, and of such great authority in France as his alliance will confirm our peace and keep the Frenchmen in allegiance. And so the Earl of Armagnac may do, because he is near kinsman unto Charles. Besides, his wealth does warrant a liberal dower, where Runier sooner will receive than give. A dower, my lords, disgrace not so your king, that he should be so abject, base, and poor to choose for wealth and not for perfect love. So worthless, peasants bargain for their wives as market men for oxen, sheep, or horse. Then yield, my lords, and here conclude with me that Margaret shall be queen and none but she. Whether it be through force of your report, my noble lord of Suffolk, I cannot tell. 
But this I am assured. I feel such sharp, such sharp dissension in my breast, such fierce alarms of both hope and fear, as I am sick with the working of my thoughts. Take, therefore, shipping post, my lord, to France. Agree to any covenant, and procure that Lady Margaret do vouchsafe to come, to cross the seas to England and be crowned King Henry's faithful and anointed queen. <coughs> Suffolk hath prevailed, and thus he goes as did the youthful Paris once to Greece, with hope to find the like event in love, but prosper better than the Trojan did. Margaret shall now be queen and rule the king, but I will rule both her, the king, and realm. Thank you. 